slowly you're wearing through your topsoil because every time you do this activity, there's less and less soil because the only thing that holds soil in place is those perennial crops, those um, not crops, the perennial plants um, acted on by the action of animals. That's what builds soil. The moment that you clear that land, it is just like us, it dies under exposure. All the places where agriculture first started are just, they're just dust. Like we've all seen pictures of Iraq, you know, because of the war and it's a desert, right? Everybody just thinks of like some rocks and then some sand and maybe a few goats here and there eating the little bits of scrub that are left. That was a forest, people. It was a forest. It was so dense, sunlight never touched the ground. We need to restore these ecosystems. It's the only hope that we've got, and we need to learn to live inside them again. It's what we did for two million years. This is why I am not hopeless. It's because for two million years, we were not monsters and destroyers. It's just one activity that wrecked us. told in school is what? Oh, we were all starving. It was so hard being a hunter-gatherer. We had no control over our food. And then this wonderful thing happened. We figured out how to do agriculture and we were never hungry again. And hasn't it been great? And the truth is exactly the opposite. Hunger does not become institutionalized until people take up agriculture. There were absolutely seasonal moments of hunger. You know, at the end of the winter, everybody probably would have been hungry a little bit because the animals were really lean. They were getting kind of slim out there. But eventually, you know, it comes back and then everybody gets to eat again. So you'd see that in the archaeological record, right? There's those little lines and the bones and the teeth. It's like, all right, there was a little bit of a hunger. But you don't see evidence of famine ever in hunter-gatherers. Like, that's just not a thing until you're dependent on two crops and one of them fails. Um, then it's over. You're all, you know, you all starve. And in agricultural societies, <laughs> every time it ends in collapse and the last proteins in the cooking pots are always human cannibalism like it's so grim that that's where it, it's always where it ends mm. um and it's this is just civilizations okay civilization is what's based on agriculture it's a way of life based on cities cities are only possible because of agriculture so when you do agriculture when you do this when you take over the land and then you plant these annual crops you will temporarily have a surplus okay you don't do that as hunter gatherers you have nowhere to put a surplus you don't need a surplus when you're hungry you just go out and get more food you don't need to have a surplus of anything it's all there. It's all just, you know, you can bury it in the ground and ferment it and then eat it in three months because it's more nutritious. We don't need to do it. There's always food available in your, you know, in your region and you know seasonally what to eat and where your camp is and all that. Or like here in the Pacific Northwest, people had permanent settlements because there were so many fish, the salmon coming up the rivers. So they had permanent. So you see that pattern too, and that's fine. But nobody's destroying the land and just planting it for humans, right? But that's the problem. So they do this, right? You, you take over the land, you plant the annuals. You harvest them. Now, where are you going to put them? So now you've got these human settlements that are dependent on it. And slowly you're wearing through your topsoil because every time you do this activity, there's less and less soil because the only thing that holds soil in place is those perennial crops, those um, not crops, the perennial plants um, acted on by the action of animals. That's what builds soil. The moment that you clear that land, it is just like us, it dies under exposure. So you've got the sun and the rain and the wind all beating it to death and there's no bacteria left. So it just turns into dust, which is literally what's happened around the world. All the places where agriculture first started are just, they're just dust. Like we've all seen pictures of Iraq, you know, because of the war and it's a desert, right? Everybody just thinks of like some rocks and then some sand and maybe a few goats here and there eating the little bits of scrub that are left. That was a forest, people. It was a forest. It was so dense, sunlight never touched the ground. It was an oak savanna. Like, it's gone. It's been gone for thousands of years. Why? Because people started doing agriculture. So that's the problem. You use up all of your land. You slowly draw down your soil. You've got this huge population explosion because of that temporary surplus. Now what are you going to do? You've got two choices. You can all starve, or you can conquer your neighbors and take their stuff. And this is the thing about agriculture is that it makes a permanent class of warriors possible, soldiers. They don't exist in hunter-gatherers. And I'm not saying people don't fight each other and sometimes kill each other. And what, like, yeah, humans are humans. You know, we're, we're not a different kind of human. We're still human. I get that there are conflicts. I'm not saying that, like, life is perfect for hunter-gatherers. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, like, making a romance here. But mm -hmm. the point is that there's an entire class of people who feel this war. And civilization makes that possible because of the surplus, it also makes it inevitable because you're drawing down all your resources. 
because you're living in a, a population density that requires the importation. And if your neighbors don't want to give you their stuff, you're going to have to go out and get it from them. And that's why agricultural societies always end up militarized. Hey, everyone. Really happy to announce a new sponsor of the show for everyone in Australia, and that is Stockman Steaks, who deliver steaks and other meats direct to customer, delivering high-quality grass-fed and grass-finished pasture-raised beef and other meats frozen to your door. They have high-fat options for those of us on a keto carnivore diet, and you can even order grass-fed and finished beef fat trimmings that you can fry up and add to your meal for the extra fat with high omega-3 fatty acids in it. If you're in Australia, unfortunately, they're not shipping outside of Australia at the moment, but hopefully they'll be moving into other markets soon. So in Australia, you can use code CHAFEE for a free order of beef mints or another free gift as it may change from time to time. So just go down to stockmansteaks.com.au today and place your order now. Thanks, guys. So now you've got this rolling sort of catastrophe across the human race of imperialism and genocide and, oh yeah, slavery, because somebody has to do that backbreaking labor. So you got to go out and conquer your neighbors and take all their stuff, their water, their fish, their trees, because you've used up all of yours. You don't have any soil left, so there's no food coming in. Um, and then, of course, you take the people as well and you make them do that that backbreaking labor. Um, even in the year, by the year 1800, which we usually say is the beginning of like the industrial age, the machine age, um, at that point, 75%, fully three quarters of the human beings alive on the planet were living in some form of indenture, serfdom, or slavery. Three quarters. Because that's the only way for the leisure class to have any any leisure is somebody else has to do the backbreaking work. So it ends up with these really stratified societies. It's the beginning of patriarchy. It's just like nothing good has happened since then. We wrecked our health. We've wrecked the planet. We've taken out 99% of the habitat for wild animals. You can't say this is good for animals. Um, and we destroyed our capacity to be human with each other because now we live in these terrible hierarchies um, that involve you have to live behind a military barricade. So here we are. We're like, we've done it. And now we're wrecking the climate on top of it all. And just one more thing. Global warming did not start with burning fossil fuel. It started with the beginning of agriculture. Why? Because we blew through all the soil. And what that means is that you know you, you too much oxygen gets in, the biological activity increases really quickly, and the soil structure just evaporates essentially. And where does the carbon go? Up. So rice agriculture in particular um, has been horrendous for the climate, but you can take you know, see that sort of that hockey stick graph, the famous one. So you're 1800 to now, all the carbon we've added. And that is true. We did that by burning coal and then oil and gas. That's all true. But if you back that up like 6,000 years, it's the same amount of carbon that we added. So fossil fuel is an accelerant to this process. Absolutely an accelerant. But the same amount was done just from blowing through all the, all the, the, the fossil soil, we can call it. Um, by doing agriculture because we wrecked the soil. So mm -hmm. all of that is like, this is what this is. Agriculture is a war against the living world and you're going to have to keep fighting it every year. And that's what plows are for because the world doesn't want to be a monocrop of corn. It wants to be a forest or a grassland and it keeps trying to come back. Like life wants to live. This is the planet trying to fight back. And we just keep pushing it out um, and saying, no, we just want corn and we just want wheat. So we're going to keep fighting you and all the animals that want to be there. Well, we're just going to drive you into extinction. There's no more bison. Like it's all wheat and corn and soy now, right? Um, elephants couldn't survive rice agriculture. They're all they were this. They were the pink Asian elephants. They're all gone. Um, that's what's happened around the globe, and it's it's absolutely horrifying once you start to learn about it. And I could not absorb this as a vegan because I needed my diet to be the wonderful, peaceful you know, animal, happy, friendly, sustainable food. And it's not, it's the worst thing humans have done to the planet. Mm -hmm. We need to restore these ecosystems. It's the only hope that we've got and we need to learn to live inside them again. That's what we did for 2 million years. This is why I am not hopeless. It's because mm -hmm. for 2 million years, we were not monsters and destroyers. It's this one activity that wrecked us. It's just the one thing, the agriculture, Just we just got to stop. And in fact, if you stop eating that food and starting food that actually does repair the world, that repairs the soil and repairs the waterways and fills up the groundwater, you know, the, the aquifers again and makes the habitat for all those creatures to come back. Um, it's actually not that hard. And that food is actually perfect for the human template. And I speak here of grass-fed beef and bison, and you mm -hmm. cannot be happier than eating that food. So in fact, you can take those same values and change the world into the world that we would rather have. Um, by doing a very simple thing, which is finding a grass-based farm in your area 
and buying all the beef or bison that you want. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Behind. Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks guys. So <laughs> that's um well, thank you for that. That was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, my mini lecture, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so well, that, that's one of the things too that that uh, people say was like, okay, well, you know, let's say that that eating meat is is the, you know, very good for you, and we should only eat that. How are we going to feed? You know, eight billion people is that possible uh eating it you know with just yeah. meat what do you think about that when people okay say? nothing that we do can feed eight billion people and that is the thing that we need to face we are on such bad overshoot that it's hard to have hope some days when i wake up um there's literally nothing the only reason we have eight billion people is because we're eating fossil fuel so there's this thing called the Haber-Bosch process that was discovered by two chemists um, they needed to make nitrogen for the war effort in Germany. Um, and they figured out a way to take uh, oil and gas as the feedstock and get usable nitrogen out of it. And then that was used to make bombs. Isn't that lovely? Um, and then when the war is over, oh, what are we going to do with these nitrogen factories? Well, a whole other bunch of scientists around the globe were cheering this on because for, God, 80 years, ever since nitrogen had been discovered, there were a number of scientists who were like, I think we have a problem, which is that we're going to run out of nitrogen. We're clearly blowing through the topsoil. Uh, where's the nitrogen going to come from? Well, we're going to use that guano for a while, but that's clearly on drawdown. Like there's not going to be more of it. There's these huge caves that are filled with guano, right? And they were using that to make bombs too. And that's why Germany did this was because their supply was cut off um, in the Atlantic. So they couldn't get to it anymore. And they're like, how do we make bombs? I'm like, we got it. We can do it chemically. We're going to do this. So, you know. Anyway, all these scientists were like, yes, this this is the, this is how we're going to solve this because we're looking at mass starvation uh, without the nitrogen. Um, and so this thing was created that was the, the Green Revolution. So after World War II, all of those nitrogen factories were turned over to the peacetime effort. And what it meant was we're going to create fertilizer that plants can use, and then we're going to breed plants that really love this nitrogen stuff, like really heavy doses of it. We're going to pump them full of it. And we're going to make them grow really short because we don't want any of that cellulose stuff. We just want that big fat seed head. So we're going to make plants that are like as biologically to the limit as we possibly can that are super short, super big seed head, you know, until they basically fall over and we're going to feed all the hungry people. So that worked for about a decade. But, you know, what happens, a few things happen. One is that the human population quadrupled under this plan. So we didn't save we didn't fix this problem. We've, in fact, made it four times worse. Because now what are they all going to eat? Um, we are absolutely on the downside of peak oil. And, you know, people make all kinds of predictions. I think that's a very bad idea. We are eventually going to run out. Like, any adult should be able to tell you that you have a substance that is finite and you're using it. So whether you use it slowly or whether you use it quickly, whether you don't even know exactly how much there is, it doesn't matter. You are eventually going to hit zero. Mm -hmm. You will draw it down until you can't get any more of it. Or really what's going to happen is it's too expensive to pump it out anymore. It's not worth the energy that goes into it to get it out. We're going to approach that at some point in the next few decades, right? We are absolutely on that downside of that curve. So what do we think we're going to eat when the oil and the gas run out? Because this was never a plan with the future, right? Like the oil and the gas... It's not like the big drops of oil have like a birds and bees talk with the little drops of oil. Like they don't reproduce. It's oil. Okay. It's like ancient bits of sunlight plants crushed, you know, millions of years later, we have these pools of oil underneath the surface of the planet and they are finite. There aren't going to be any more. It takes millions of years for them to accumulate. We've, we've blown through them right now. Take any human being around the globe, test the nitrogen in their bodies. Half of it comes directly from, from fossil fuel, half of it. That's what we're eating. We're literally eating oil. Mm. We're literally eating oil. There is no future in this. So nothing we do is going to feed 8 billion people. Okay, we've used up all the nitrogen that was in the soil. We've blown through all the soil. There's none left. We've skinned the planet alive. 
And now we're on our way toward the end of all the fossil fuel that was sort of taking over from that, sort of filling the gap. And in the meantime, we've got you know, this enormous population of people. So they don't have a solution if they're offering you some kind of vegan you know, alternative. That, that's not a future. It's, it's just not. We don't have enough oil and gas forever to feed these people. Here's the thing about annuals. Uh, they only live a really short time. And so their whole reproductive strategy is to make really big seeds that have a little coat around them. And they can drop into the ground and stay there until they get their moment. And their moment is a disaster. So I like to use the analogy of...